Welcome everyone to today's HR webinar. My name is Keelan Burke. I work with Retail Excellence. I'm delighted that you could join us today for this uh, very insightful session with Tom Smith and Associates. Um, firstly, I'd like to just bring you up to speed on what's happening with Retail Excellence. Uh, we are very much working on your behalf to continue to push with government for further supports. Um, in the upcoming October budget, we're pushing for a further change to the EWSS scheme to make it more flexible to help your business through this period. We're pushing for a further write-off of rates until the end of the year to give you a boost in cash flow. Um, we're pushing for further reduction in the hospitality VAT rate for hospitality members and a further permanent reduction in the 23% VAT rate. We're pushing for further e-commerce supports as well to help you adjust to this change in, in new normal retail. And we're pushing for further town revival initiatives as well to help bring back our empty units um, into life. So we're very much pushing for these measures on your behalf. Um, and we understand it's been a very challenging few weeks and continues to be so. So if, if you ever have any questions, feel free to, to ask the Retail Excellence team. So just to kick off with first, I'd like to introduce um, our corporate partner, Barry Whelan. He's the CEO of XL Recruitment. He's one of our longest serving uh, partners uh, and is probably one is the leading retail agency here in Ireland for recruitment. So Barry, maybe just bring us up to speed in terms of the trends in recruitment and what's happening and what are the options possibly available to members? Sure. Um, I suppose firstly, thanks for inviting me on, Kieran. Uh, very kind of you and Duncan. Um, <laughs> the, uh, for anyone who don't know um, who I am or who Excel Recruitment is, um, Excel Recruitment is a retail recruitment company. We've been going around uh, going since 2002 when I set up the business. Um, we have 44 uh, recruitment consultants. We're based in offices in Dublin, uh, Cork and Kildare. And um, yeah, my own background was in retail. I worked for <clears throat> ABF, I worked for Duns, and I worked for Brant Thomas Group before moving into retail, or sorry, moving into recruitment. Um, so I suppose it's been a very, as you can imagine, Keelan, it's been a very challenging market um, from a recruitment perspective. So I suppose what we've seen really is, um, if we look at our divisions, um, our grocery division has performed very well throughout the crisis. Um, Grocery has obviously done quite well from a sales perspective in the main, particularly the large supermarket groups. Um, and they've, they've had a demand for staff and management from us. And so it's been quite busy within the grocery sector. Um, obviously when retail was closed, there wasn't any business in uh, non-essential retail, but we saw a really good um, pickup in everything from DIY to furniture to home as soon as those stores reopened and obviously DIY retailers enjoyed a very, very strong summer um, considering they've been closed. Um, so we saw a good uptake there. So the things, the trends that we're sort of seeing is uh, groceries is, is, is quite steady and um, still a need for management and staff. And um, non-food, uh, if it's DIY, home, furniture, garden is performing quite well. We're seeing quite a, um, an uptake in terms of jobs. Um, and where we're seeing real challenges would be things like fashion, for instance. So uh, fashion has been, uh, has been very, very quiet for us. Um, we've seen, obviously, the stores closed, and then we've seen online uh, really affect um, the level of store jobs. So um, the challenges are things like uncertainty. It's very hard mm -hmm. to do planning when there's so much uncertainty around. Um, there's also real challenges around um, something that we've never seen before, which is generally we either operate in a candidate or employee-driven market, or we operate in an employer-driven market. So if you think about, let's say, the talk I would have done at last year's expo, you know, it would have been about how to attract talent, all about talent retention, talent attraction, you know, employer branding, all that sort of stuff. And that's a real um, candidate market when employers are really all about making their brand the best brand and how to attract talent. And when the recession was in, it was an opposite, the, op the market was opposite. So it was very much um, all about the candidates and in terms of them being more flexible. So it's gone from... Um, operating within an, an employee's market to an employer's market. And now the employees feel it's, an, it's, an, it's really weird. The employees feel it's an employer's, employee's market and the employers feel it's an employer's market. So because of the rate of unemployment, employers are, um, are really 
looking for candidates to come on board and maybe take a bit of a hit in terms of their expectation around salary or benefits. But because of the supports that are in place, and I guess the uncertainty, um, the employees are also demanding, you know, very good jobs and good benefits and good pay. So yeah. there's a bit of a disconnect there and we're finding it very difficult. And so my people are working very hard on a placement where they're having to really um, work very hard with the client to make sure that they uh, do their best to get the employee on board, but also work very hard with the employee to make sure they have the right expectation within a pandemic. So that's been very, very challenging, that kind of mindset. Um, okay. But as I said, we've seen, you know, we've seen positivity in anything to do with the home. We've mm -hmm. seen positivity around sustainability as well. So sustainability is really on trend at the moment. So we're seeing like um, some of our clients are in the charity sector and they're performing quite well. They're, they're having quite a good, um, uh, they're, they're actually one of our, our partners um, is a, a large chain of charity shops and they're back they're at pre-COVID levels of sales now. So oh. things working, you know. <laughs> great, great, great. That's good, Barry. And yeah. in terms of, um, you know, facing into this winter period where possibly, you know, COVID cases rising and, and close contacts rising, is there mm -hmm. options from, from your angle in, in terms of staff? So really at the beginning of the, of the crisis, um, we, would, we would supply a lot of temporary labour um, to okay. retail, hospitality and to events. So at the beginning of the crisis, we got a surge in demand for uh, retail labour because of panic buying. So we had just under 700 staff working in stores around the country uh, packing shelves due to panic buying. Um, and then what we found, we started getting requests for uh, contingency workforce planning as a case of COVID would happen in a shop. So for instance, every Friday we send out an availability list to all of the Musgraves units and um, that will show them what staff we have available around the country and um, to go into stores if uh, a case of COVID comes in and that stores, the staff in the store have to isolate. It also shows them what general operatives we have available for the distribution centres as well because um, the supply chain is very, very busy. So areas that really took off were the supply chain areas um, and let's say for instance, fashion would have, would have declined, things like supply chain would have increased, and obviously online shopping is, is part of logistics. So the need for drivers, the need for pickers and packers is very high. So we have um, a couple of things going on. We have contingency workforce planning. If anyone wants to contact me about that, um, I can share my details. Um, and we also have, um, well, we don't, we, we're, we're not required for emergency um, or for panic buying anymore. It's very much uh, replacing staff who are suffering from COVID. Okay. So, that's what's going on with us and, and and barry can that work across other sectors as well outside of grocery that temporary yeah, 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 yeah great at the moment that we're finding the needs we, we have uh, people working in pharmacy and people working in grocery so the real need has happened in those two sectors okay and it's like you know um we have staff down in in four different convenience stores in Kerry at the moment for instance because um there was an outbreak of covid in four different stores and so oh so they close the store our staff a deep clean happens and then our staff go in to to manage until the staff are back Okay. Okay. That's interesting. Now, I don't think, you know, that'll be definitely in interesting to a lot of members who possibly are yeah. looking at plans. We're getting in a uh, big, we're getting in big demands for it at the moment. And it, like it's in, um, it's in far flung locations. So it's not just in Dublin. So yeah, that, that's a good point to make in fairness. Yeah. Um, no, so I appreciate that, Barry. And uh, if any retail excellence member, you know, needs any recruitment uh, support, feel free to reach out to Barry. We're happy to link you in with Barry as well and his team. Um, so I appreciate your support. Cool. Thanks, Kilo. Thanks, man. Thanks, Barry. Thanks. So just moving on now, um, I'd like to introduce Tom, Tommy Smith of Tom Smith and Associates, our HR expert and guru. Um, so Tommy, over to you. Thanks very much, Keelan. Um, Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks very much for, for, for tuning in. Um, I just want to go through, I suppose, the agenda for today in kind of the next kind of half an hour, 40 minutes or so. I'm going to try and squeeze some um, questions and answers in at the end. Um, I just want to go through some initial comments and considerations to begin with, and then I suppose the three topics we want to, we want to look at for the, the purposes of today are some absence management issues um, and then my colleague Tara might bring everybody up to date on the current trends with the, uh, I suppose, HSA inspections. But uh, as we are seeing it, the, the sneaky WRC inspections that are coming in, as well as the HSA ones. 
Um, and then I just want to talk, I suppose, unfortunately, dare I say, I have to talk about possibly labour cost savings that, that people are, are facing now and, and, again, might start to face as, uh, as the winter progresses and as 2021 comes into play. Um, so I suppose to begin with, anyway, just for some initial, initial comments, um, look, um, if you want to move on the, the, the slides there, guys, um, I, think, I think it won't come any, as any surprise to listeners that, you know, it is just going to be a very challenging winter ahead, both, for, both commercially and, you know, especially from the likes of the HR perspective. Um, there's so many external factors, guys, um, that kind of, I suppose, are impacting on certain things that can and can't be said on the likes of webinars like this, but will also render best laid plans, you know, um, um, as the winter progresses will just lead to scenarios where you guys are going to have to react. I mean, obviously, things like local restrictions that we're seeing at the moment, you know, is or isn't Dublin going to come out of, of, of level three um, next week? Is the, the whispers all around the business community in Cork is, you know, are we facing it as of tomorrow? And I, I, you can just see ver various communities um, dipping in and out of various levels over the next while. Obviously, changing government and HSE policy. Sure, every Thursday there's a green list published, which it has had an effect in the last few weeks on travel that people are doing. You know, the, the fact that Poland and Hungary were on a green list and there was quite a substantial number of people who worked hard all year, wanted to perhaps go home to see family, and then the rug was pulled from under them as they were, were, were away, and they're coming back now having, having been in a non-green list country. So things like that are going to change as well throughout the winter. Um, not, none so more guys in individual behavior and I, I just know for a fact that every single person listening has had you know, examples of kind of you know outliers look I'm, I'm no I'm not the moral compass for behaviors let's say um, throughout COVID but you know in, in, in your teams you're gonna have people young old middle-aged who, who, who will probably do things that the HSE um, won't recommend you know and you can't control that but you're gonna have to possibly live with the consequences of it when chickens come home to roost. Um, the budget, as Keelan was saying, or yeah, you're doing what they can for you guys in, 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 um, in, in the budget, but obviously, you know, certain things like um, redundancy restrictions, the ongoing pop, ongoing government supports are gonna become far clearer in the budget, which will have an impact on, you know, end of this year and, and, and especially next year. It's mad to say how far down the list Brexit is considering it was the first word on everyone's lips for so long and, and now it's kind of you know relegated to kind of a you know a fifth or sixth on a, on a list of immediate priorities and, and of course as every year guys you know we're, we're dealing with the winter as well even forgetting covid and and weather impacts and in more recent years more than ever before things like big freezes things like storms things like unforeseen weather events have also led to to to, to issues hr issues and um, so I, I think one of the key messages for today okay is is, is control the controllable. I'm channeling my innermost Joe Smith, the rugby coach here, by saying that. But I do think, you know, if you pick up anything from today, it's, it's you know, deal with your internal strategies and your internal policies and your planning and your documents um, now. Because the more you do now, the more you may mitigate any of effects of the above factors. Okay, so moving on, guys. Um, look, in terms, of, in terms of absence management, I mean, the, the, the variety of issues. I mean, this week alone, in, in preparing for today, I wanted to take a mental note of it. And, you know, in the, in the 15, 16 calls that I personally have had about sickness absences, COVID absences, COVID issues, you know, you're talking about pretty much every single one of them had a different set of background scenarios, had a different context, and, and therefore led to possibly a different strategy or different advice from me. So for that reason, forgive me, but on this webinar now, and even a 45 minute webinar, it's very hard to go through every single type of scenario that you're going to come across because you're going to have situations where, of course, people are on regular sick leave. That's still happening. I mean, you're going to have employees who themselves are, are, are displaying COVID symptoms at home and they ring your contact work or even at work, you know. Um, and look, we've had so many frustrating cases already where an employee is accepted. They've come to work for a day or two not feeling the best but they presume they were fine. And the repercussions that has in the workplace is, you know, has, has, has been pretty substantial. You're gonna have employees, you know, getting confused or, or, or getting nervous about the close contact versus casual contact. So people who are a close contact of a, of a possible COVID case or who are then are a close contact of a positive COVID case. People who are casual contacts, 
of possible or positive COVID cases. You know, people maybe that isn't on the list, but people with other high risk people in their in their in their domestic setting, you know, underlying conditions or elderly people. And of course, the, the instances of isolation after foreign travel. And, and the problem with all of these is that, you know, with moving parts on things like government policy as well, really, you guys are going to have to get a case by case advice on uh, issues that arise in your workplace from, of course, we're always here under the REI scheme, but you'll be checking up things like HSE websites, health and safety information, you know, um, REI partner with Sea Change as well, who are, who are really leaders in their field in terms of, in terms of health and safety and, 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 uh, and, and the protocols that they can have in place. And also, guys, you know, if you have a good occupational doctor or medical professional, having them on speed dial or buying them a bottle of wine or a box of chocolates coming into winter could be a very good tactic because to, you know, to have someone kind of with, with, with cutting edge medical advice who you can uh, dip into as well is if at all possible is someone to have on speed dial on your phone for the next year of your lives. Um, so moving on to the next slide, look, um, the HSE website, it isn't bad. Okay. I mean, I have some sheets in front of me here as well now in terms of just, definitions and clarity on things like um, close contacts and casual contacts, okay? Um, and that's gonna be something that's important for you guys to have and possibly even to show your employees. So just keeping up to date with that website, the HSE coronavirus section is something, um, you know, it's far better I tell you that than actually have reams and reams of slides for this webinar because, you know, I don't trust that things won't change in 24, 48 hours as things progress. So to really allow you to go to the website and get cutting edge information as issues arise is probably the best, the best tactic here. But suffice to say some, some, some basic information, okay? I mean, obviously if someone is, is um, developing COVID symptoms or displaying COVID symptoms, obviously you're telling them not to come to work. Or if for whatever reason they have decided to come to work, they immediately leave work. They possibly go to the isolation room that, of course, you've all, you've all uh, developed and, and they then leave work, okay? And, and they ring their GP or occupational health immediately and, and go for a test. And the thing about, about it is, even if they have some sort of symptoms which would have led them to have a COVID test, even if it's negative, they're, they're gone for 14, sorry, they're gone at that stage for, for 48 hours after they're symptom free. Um, Close contact, okay, and, I, I, and I, again, so one, one of the key takeaways I want you guys to have from here is, is try to be proactive and control your controllables. Another one is really, really knuckle down here on the difference between a close contact and a casual contact, okay, because the difference is critical, all right, and, and how you, what you do in your workplace could be very critical to whether a person gets labeled a close contact or a casual contact, all right. If a person's a close contact and nominated the same um, by the by the HSE um, or 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 the, the tracer app. Well, then look, they're they're basically gone for fourteen days. If someone's a close contact, even if they get a negative test, they still have to stay out. They still have to restrict their movements and will possibly have to do a second test. Whereas a casual contact doesn't have to restrict their movements at all until until they may get may get any more information which ups them from a casual contact to. Uh, to a, a close contact, all right? So, um, okay, we can move on there now, guys, on it, all right? So look, two key proactive areas that I want you to do, all right? Obviously, when you guys would have reopened after publication of these government return to work protocols, I'm presuming, and I'm gonna take it as a given that you took those protocols seriously, all right? And not only do you have the visible uh, changes to your workplace looked after such as signage such as floor markings screens and all that but also you have the very critical response plan prepared which already has a head start on what you're going to do um, if if there's any dramas in, in your in your workplace all right um, so obviously guys you really have to for whatever reason guys that's taken a back, a back foot in the last couple of months because you know life has taken over works work's been busy and all that really dust off any documents you produced and really try to hone in on things like you know your your, your social distancing techniques your anything work from home zones guys if you have a larger um, square footage floor just get guys to be rude to each other at work get them to be antisocial don't mix teams if it's possible. Don't mix zones. Staggered starts so that people don't kind of 
access certain corridors at the one time. You know, I think my, my colleague Tara is going to talk in a while, but even uh, things like um, if you have a clocking machine where people thumbprint or tap the one screen, you know, you need to be careful because what's the point in having them 20 feet apart all day long if they tap the same screen within five minutes of each other that morning? That in itself could lead to one positive case, meaning an entire workforce is, is deemed uh, a close contact right? Staggered rest breaks and things like online training or Zoom meetings, of course, okay? But I, I, know, I know that this is the same list you possibly have had kind of numerous times now, but I think, look, we're, we're, the resurgence is on here and, and the more disciplined you can ensure your team are in terms of adhering to it, the more, you know, the better your contact log is, let's say, all right? Um, the the more likely that if there's a scenario and the HSA, HSE contact you, right, the more likely you can with absolute confidence say, no, if Billy has tested positive, I can tell you the only people who would be defined as close to him are Mary and Joseph, right? The other people in the business were far away from him. They never had an interaction. They started at different times and they may have been in a similar, in the same building as him, but there was no cross-contamination. The more confident you guys can be yourselves and the more confidence you can display um, to, to the HSE, the more comfortable I am that they may be deemed in the casual bracket, not the close bracket in your retail business until you can you know, find people from other, other sectors to, or other, other locations to come in or contact the likes of Barry in Excel and say, Barry, can you get me an emergency team ASAP? So your COVID protocols, your response plan is something to really focus on, guys, and ensure that the protocols are adhered to very clearly on your work floors. And if that means you need to contact all department managers or location managers and really reinforce that to them, do it. Um, so moving on to the next slide now, because another, another thing I would suggest, guys, is look, most of you in terms and conditions of employment, contracts, handbooks would have you know, a, a regular absence management policy. You know, you deal with things like if you're not feeling well, when you have to contact the company, how you have to contact the company, when you need to get in a medical search, how often, etc. reserve the right for company doctors, that, that type of thing, right? There's no harm really, you know, pimping that up and producing a winter 2020 absence management policy that contains more information um, for people. You know, um, it can be a one-off policy that lasts for the next six months. It's, it, it, it supplants the existing policy. But when, you know, when COVID goes away or when the winter is over, you know, you'll, 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 you'll revise it and get it out there to everybody. So expand on things like if you're feeling ill with COVID symptoms, you know, whatever else you do, don't come to work. Ring HR, ring your manager, ring the owner. OK, um, what communication standards do you expect? What should they do at that stage? Do they are you going to arrange occupational support for them from a medical point of view? Do they go to their own GP? You know, um, what interview do you need to have with them or what information will you need from them on any contacts they feel may be uh, affected? Obviously, you, you, you should have a contact logbook, but it's still no harm double checking with the employees if there's anything missed in that. And uh, who, do, who, who, who could be a close contact or who's definitely not a close contact. Um, you can also inform them in the likes of that absence management policy how long they may be out of work because of it, okay? So obviously if they're a close contact or they're being tested or they're positive, what does that mean in terms of how long they're gonna be out of work? If they are sick, so if they do have COVID or if they're just out sick generally, what supports are in place in terms of regular illness benefit, in terms of the enhanced COVID specific illness benefit that's still available for employees, and obviously any company sick pay scheme that you guys volunteer to people. <clears throat> if they're not sick, but they're out because they have to restrict their movements based on HSE advice, again, what options exist for them um, you know, if, if, if they're in a role, it's possible to work from home. Can you allow from that? If not, you know, they're not working. So there's no compulsion necessarily for you to, to pay them. But are there other forms of leave that can be looked at? Would they have any time in lieu worked up or overtime that they could, they could, they could cash in? Um, issues like force majeure leave, parental leave, new parents leave. You know, they're all acts that could be considered or they could book holidays for some of that time off. All right, so the more you good guys take control of that, um, pimp up maybe an existing absence management policy, again, going back to what I'm saying about controlling your controllables, the more clarity you're offering now, and the staff don't necessarily think that you're, 
you know, sucking and seeing as you're going along. It's all based on as, 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 uh, as much prepared information and standardized policy as possible. Okay, um, look, I'm happy to take some Q&As on that afterwards. But for now, what I'm going to do is hand over to my colleague, uh, Tara Cooney, who's going to maybe talk you through uh, certainly some of the things we've seen on the ground and the particular quirks that inspectors are coming to um, from, a, from an employment point of view um, in the last couple of months. Thanks, Tommy. So today I'm going to talk about the HSA WRC inspections that are currently being carried out across the country. So as you might already know, the Health and Safety Authority have been tasked to inspect and enforce return to work protocols to adhere to COVID-19 regulations. The WRC inspectors, amongst others, are helping out the HSA in carrying out these inspections. But as we already know, the Health and Safety is not the WRC inspectors' natural workload. So what they have been doing upon these inspections is performing a dual inspection in relation to safety and employment law. So in terms of safety, what they're really keeping an eye out for is if you have screens in place, if the correct, the correct floor markings where applicable, you have signage, um, you have a sanitizer in the correct places, you have a contact logbook for contact tracing reasons, you have an isolation room or an area if a colleague or an employee um, creates or has symptoms of COVID-19 in the workplace that they can go there um, until they can be removed from the workplace and that employees receive the correct training and that there's information in place to adhere to COVID-19 regulations. As I mentioned, when the WRC inspectors are there, they have been checking employment rights in the workplace. So the main employment basics that require record keeping that may have been affected by COVID-19 are the main areas of concern that the WRC inspectors are keeping an eye out for. So the traditional way of these inspections is on site, but the WRC have been quite creative in creating new ways to do these inspections. So they have been sending questions via email or they have been ringing or carrying out Zoom calls to carry out these inspections. They have been carrying out these Zoom calls with employees and employers asking certain questions to ensure that the inspection is carried out correctly. So moving on there. Um, the five main areas of concern that inspectors have been looking out for in relation to COVID-19 are as follows. So timekeeping. You must keep an accurate timekeeping records for all employees. This is whether the employees are is working remotely or if they're working on site. It's an obligation of an employer under the Organisation of Working Time Act to ensure that you have the start, finish and break times for all employees either working remotely or working on site. As Tommy has mentioned, that some clocking in systems cannot be used due to COVID-19. And that's not a valid excuse for the WRC. They still require that you keep a timekeeping record, um, such as a hard copy timesheet that in, just said the um, employees working remotely could send over via email or post, or the employees working on site can fill in that their start times and their finish times and break times, and this must be signed by the employee and the employer. The next area concerns public holidays. They are really checking to ensure that all employees have received their public holiday entitlement, even if they were on layoff. Even if employees, as I've said, were on layoff, they still retain the entitlement to the public holidays for the 13 weeks. So you need to ensure that you may need to award the public holiday entitlement for St. Patrick's Day, Easter and the May and June uh, bank holidays that took place during lockdown. Employees may need to be credited these days annual leave. As we know, it's been a crazy year for annual leave. No annual leave was accrued during layoff. Employees will likely have some earned. Employees may have booked holidays and had to cancel them, therefore cancel their annual leave. As the green list is changing weekly, employees have not been taking their usual annual leave balance and therefore this year annual leave balances are sky high. You have to ensure that you have a policy in place if you're going to allow your employees carry over days or not. If you are going to allow them carry over days, you need to ensure that they, create, they receive the correct information so they know exactly how they can carry over days, when to display that they are carrying over days and for how long they can carry over the days for, six months or a year. If you are not allowing your employees to carry over your carry over annual leave days this year, you need to ensure that they are aware of this. You need to ensure that they are aware that if they don't take their annual leave holidays at the end until the end of the year, that they will lose it. We really recommend that you encourage your employees to take their annual leave entitlement as they are entitled to it. Premium rates of pay. So for Sunday premium and overtime. Employees are working different hours, they're in different teams, so therefore you need to ensure that you are capturing any contractual rights that they may have to premium payments. If an employee works on a Sunday, they are entitled to, by law, some sort of premium. This premium can be an allowance, an increased rate of pay, or paid time off, or a combination of all these. 
Another area where the WRC are getting quite sticky on is pay slips. Employees under the Payment of Wages Act are entitled to a pay slip for all hours worked. The WRC are requesting to see pay slips for any week of the year for employees and their corresponding timesheet to ensure that there's compliance between both. You also must ensure that you have evidence on policies on bullying and harassment in your terms and conditions of employment. As we all know, anxieties are so high in the workplace at the moment. Everyone seems to be a judge of everyone else's behaviour. We all have employees who are currently very uncomfortable in the workplace and there must be a valid policy on bullying and harassment in the workplace as employees have, are entitled to bring their grievance forward to the employers and the employers are obliged to investigate this grievance correctly, align with the policies in place. The WRC are getting quite sticky in that area as they are aware of the uncomfortableness of employees at the moment. Carrying out these inspections, WRC are also asking to, as I've mentioned, to interview employees. In these interviews, they are currently asking about public holidays if they're receiving them, their minimum wage if, they're, if the company is adhering to it, rest breaks and start and finish times. Moving on, the WRC, along with the European Labour Authority, have rolled out a campaign called EU for Fair Work. The main aim behind this campaign is to tackle undeclared work. They are trying to raise awareness amongst employees and employers of the downfalls of undeclared work for society. They have been using Twitter a lot for their main aim of communication for this. They have stated that undeclared work deprives workers of social protection, it distorts competition between businesses as there's work being undeclared, and it leads to a huge gap in public fairness. If you're in an industry where cash can be taken, they may ask your team some queries as part of the inspection. So you need to ensure that you have all your work declared and in the correct place. At the moment, the construction industry seems to be the line of life with these inspections. But we really wanted to bring it to your attention as that's not to say that the retail sector could be the next sector to be investigated. And as a WRC are carrying out these HSA WRC inspections, they could ask these questions also. The WRC have supplied a basic paperwork to assist these inspections. It is very basic, but it assists compliance. We will send this to the RAI members in the update tomorrow on the email, but also if anyone wants to expand on their basic terms of employment to get in contact and we'd love to help. I'm going to pass back to Tommy now, who's going to finish off by talking about labour cost savings. Okay, guys, I think, I think I'm back there now. Um, thanks, Tara. Um, look, guys, I suppose it's never, it's never an enjoyable topic to bring up, I suppose, but we have to be realistic as well. You know, I mean, the change from the temporary wage subsidy scheme to the employment wage subsidy scheme and the, you know, the qualifying requirements uh, for that means that a, a reasonable cohort of you guys and, and, and businesses around the country, you know, no longer meet the primary 30% threshold. That's not to say you're still not trading significantly down on last year. Um, so, you know, it means that, that, you know, there's a far higher percentage of your, your payroll, you know, back, back which you're liable for it again. Um, you take that coupled with, you know, pop is being stepped down in stages, all right? Um, but I suppose good, good news on that front is that it's, it's still available and it does accept new applicants again now. Um, and finally, I suppose another nugget in this whole thing is, um, you know, since, since, since the start of the summer, I suppose the employers have been protected from claims of um, redundancy by employees um, who are on layoff. And that's still extended until the 30th of November. Can they go really very far beyond that? I don't know. I mean, there may not be the appetite there to, to create a host of claims and drama in the, in the lead up to Christmas. But um, I really don't see them being able to stop keep that dam from redundancy claims going long into the new year, all right? Um, so really, the, 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 the positive thing in that, I suppose, is the fact that they, they are accepting new applicants on pop. They weren't going to do that, all right? But I think um, the fact that there's going to be, the, a lot of people are taken out of the, the, the EWSS loop now, and the fact with localized lockdowns, meaning there's more mandatory kind of closures or restrictions coming, they had to provide an outlet. So look, one outlet's there that if you are suffering again from a, a new wave and restrictions, um, the pandemic unemployment payment is still there if you have to unfortunately lay people off. Um, but then look more longer term kind of and go back to the usual holy trinity of labor cost savings. You know, it is the, it is the holy trinity of, um, you know, hours cuts, short time working, pay cuts and redundancy. 
Um, so just to again introduce you guys for the purpose of today's webinar to them and some, some you know, notes of caution, I suppose, would be the, the correct way of saying it. So if we move on there, guys, you know, I think for pay cuts, just be very clear, guys, all right? It requires written agreement or you are at risk of, of, of claims to the WRC, all right? Of course, look, employees, you know, I, I don't think trust is completely dead in the world. And if you kind of shake hands or, or, or nod a pay cut with somebody, they may never make an issue of it. But look, you know, my life in 2008, 9, 10, was just in dozens of you know uh, legal cases where employers felt the employee the pay cut was accepted the employee denied it for some reason and the employer had to back pay it and um, so look in terms of pay cuts if you have to go there first tip is just develop a logic and talk to your employees try not to be behind 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 the hr consultants or your solicitors or anything like that T talk to people and explain the logic as to where the business is at and why you're asking them for this and look you know we all like to feel we're being treated fairly so you know the more you can kind of show to people that there's some sort of staggered basis and that those who maybe are on more money are suffering a higher level of pay cut, you're giving yourself a better chance of it. But obviously with pay cuts, you know, for every, you know, it's in, what is it? it may be as much as a 95% success rate, but that means if you have hundred people in your business, you might get five people who simply will say they can't or won't accept it. So the God is thrown down to you then, do you continue with the other 95 pay cuts and, uh, and you know, leave those five people as they are, or do you move on to a different type of, uh, of labor cost saving? So look, pay cuts can happen, of course they can happen, but really guys, it is through agreement. And when I mean agreement, guys like me will always want you to get agreement in writing because that's what protects you. Short time working and hours cuts. Now in this one, I would say to you to check your contract of employment and your terms, all right? Look, ideally the contract, a handbook, is never quite as powerful as a contract. So check for clauses such as hours of work, such as layoff or short time or flexibility in terms of what it says about kind of, you know, hours of work or a band of hours or um, that from time to time you may need to reduce hours. Obviously, one of the common kind of phrases in this space is the three day week or the concept of a three day week. And I suppose that's just attractive all around because it just means an employee who has enough stamps can claim a welfare top up and you know it's linked to the 200 or so euro uh, job seekers so there could be if you move someone from a five day week to a three day week they could get 80 euros uh, social welfare um you know so while you you may save 40 percent labor costs on that person and um, they're not suffering a 40 percent cut and they have two days where they they may or may not you know be able to do something else or save on save on childcare or something like that all right and obviously look one one note is you, you can actually do a, a double win on the likes of that. I suppose that if you are, if you do qualify for the EWSS and you can still claim that fixed amount, you could still work some on a three day week and they could still claim the welfare. So you get the EWSS for them and they get welfare at the end of it. And basically the third piece in the middle is, is ultimately the cost to you on it. Um, look again with this, you know, all of this is based on a, on a fairness and a transparency, guys. You know, whether it's last in, first out, whether it's on a skills basis, a department basis, you know, it's not the Wild West either where you can just scatter gun people who you feel you want to give X number of hours to. You know, people may still object or feel they're being treated discriminatorily or in an unreasonable way if you just select it. So everything is pay cuts, short time, work redundancy. It's all process based. It's all structure based. All right. Um, but again, we're here to help on the specifics of that. The purpose of this webinar is just to kind of, I suppose, give you guys a little bit of a head start in your head to get organized if you ever have to do the likes of these things. And uh, so moving on then as well, um, look, you know, to, to call it straight to begin with, you know, while your business may be in, 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 in not in the best of positions and it's very, very logical that you may need to look at redundancies, you're still firing people. It's still a termination. It's still a dismissal. You're still putting people out on, on the breadline. So because of that, the likes of the Unfair Dismissals Act is still available to people, all right? Um, and it's critical that you, you start a redundancy analysis process properly. Try to get a target as to what you're trying to achieve in terms of reduction in headcount or a reduction in wages. And remember, you know, it's never the person. You never go after the person when you're to make redundant. It's the job. All right. Um, a fair procedure and a fair selection criteria is, is critical. In an ideal world, guys, you'd, you'd throw it out to voluntary first. If you have 10 people and you need to move to eight, your first port of call is saying, guys, would, you know what? I don't particularly want to lose any of you. Does anyone want to put their hand up? And for whatever reason I don't know about, would you consider going? 
Look, of course, cost is a factor in that, and Murphy's Law will always dictate it's the two longest serving people who, who, who are the most expensive redundancy uh, figures would put their hands up. But still, look, in an ideal world, again, an advisor like me will say it keeps you as safe as possible from disgruntlement if you are able to get volunteers for it. Another little nugget, nugget on that, guys, depending on any cost saving or redundancy program is, is, is watch for collective redundancies. Depending on your size of business, if you hit over a certain threshold, you have to write this letter to the minister telling the minister that unfortunately I have to do redundancies and there's far more structure around the process in terms of there has to be a 30 day period of consultation in relation to, uh, to any redundancies. So certainly if, if that's something, if it's, if it's more than one or two jobs, Kind of you have to look at here and there just be aware and let that alarm bell go off to check for collective redundancies so look if, if it comes to the fact that you know either voluntary hasn't worked or you don't want to particularly do it um really the two main shows in town are are, are, are life or last in first out um, or, or a skills analysis or a skills matrix i mean look last in first out again you know it's, it seems to be the most logical you know it seems to be the people who haven't served enough the, the the, the same level of time with you are the people who, you know, you're going to have to say, look, you know, I'm sorry, it's not personal, but here's the logical reason. Um, now, a skills assessment and a skills uh, matrix, absolutely. Look, I'm not going to lie, guys. It's a very, very credible way of, of um, uh, selecting redundancies, but you just have to be careful, okay? You basically, what you're doing is you're listing out five, ten, you know, reasonable factors that you feel mean uh, an employee adds something to your business and you're just ranking and rating people on that. So if you ever are looking at that style of redundancy assessment, guys, try to pick at more tangible factors than, 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 than softer factors. And also, I mean, at least something like timekeeping, you have actual records to back up maybe the scores you give somebody. The more you make it, you know, ask someone's just a good fit for me or someone's customer service is better, you know. So if I asked you guys to rank myself and Tara out of 10 in terms of how we did it on the webinar now, you know, it's based on your opinion, all right? So obviously, whichever one of us is going to be made redundant from the webinar role, we, we may think, oh, well, hang on a minute. Why was, why was that the score given to me? Whereas at least if, uh, if it was based against something tangible, like, you know, like I said, timekeeping or length of service and disciplinary record or, you know, um, Cross training in various departments or areas like that. Well, at least you're you're, you're making that if it is questioned, you have a logic and it's not based on, on personal opinions. All right. Um, look, the thing is, guys, once once a person's been selected, that it looks as if they're in danger. A real critical point to stop there being an unfair dismissal claim is that you must consider alternatives. All right. So just because my role now as webinar consultant may be redundant because you've chosen Tara over me. That doesn't mean that I'm automatically P45 and it's good luck, Tony, see you later. You may have to consider if there are other types of jobs or positions that I could do for you, um, you know, given my, given my skills that are my history. All right, if you don't do that, there may be nothing. Absolutely, there may be nothing, guys. But it's still a step you have to do to show a proper process here. All right? Um, and ultimately, depending on the outcome of that, then you may have to move on to uh, redundancies. But what I will say, guys, is... and. This goes through the theme of everything we've talked about, okay, from the, from the absence management to the, you know, any type of WRC inspections and, and to these labour costs. I, I can't stress enough that, look, I, I don't like living in the grey. I prefer to be able to give those of you who would talk to me on the phone, I hope would have that opinion. I try to give advice and not try to act in the grey and sit on the fence. But, you know, some of these scenarios we've talked about today, you know, I'm giving you preparatory information. Now, really, when it comes to this type of stuff, I'm happy to take a call from you and talk to you under the REI scheme or you have your own HR department or advisors and stuff like that, all right? So just to reiterate that tomorrow in the member update, we're just gonna send a couple of documents around. So, so first of all is the WRC set of templates, kind of 28 pages, I think or something that worth of, worth of documents that the WRC sent around that you can use um, to stress test against your own basics or if, if you are missing something like time records at the moment, you can use those templates um, and also, um, we're sending around, we, we did a document for our own core clients uh, back in kind of April, May time, just HR considerations in the, in the pandemic. And look, we're going we're gonna to send that out to all of you guys and all the RNI members tomorrow as well, because even though it's a couple of months old now, a lot of the information in it is still relevant. And there's, a, there's quite a comprehensive 
uh, section in there on on the special labour cost cutting and kind of redundancies and far more information that I was able to get through today. So look, we hope you we hope you're able to have a read of those and find them useful. And um, yeah, we're, we're we're always here at the end of the phone, guys. Anytime any of you have questions. That's great, Tommy. Appreciate that. Um, as one right. member said, they could listen to you all day. She oh, said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's one or two questions there, Tommy. I don't know. Do you want to take them or do you want to answer them afterwards? <clears throat> well, I don't mind, guys. Look, look. Yeah. If, 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 look, I, I get the fact that everyone has webinar fatigue as well. What, what, what yeah. I will say is, look, if, if there's questions there, every question will get answered. We have a, we have a team of guys here that we can divvy it out to, and everyone's going to get an answer back within within 24 hours. So, if, if guys, you know, I'm, I'm I'm very help, happy if you you can collate them for me, Keenan, and we'll yeah. We'll, people if people are happy to do that that's fine that's fine okay grand we'll, we'll do that um so appreciate it. thanks tommy and thanks tara as well in fairness that was very insightful around inspection so appreciate it um so that's everything for today guys appreciate everyone for tuning in and we'll share all the documents with you uh tomorrow so uh we'll talk to you then very good thanks, thanks guys, guys.